uh, Monsanto employees. And they presented me a uh, business card. And uh, they asked me a few questions about the kind of soybeans I plant, the kind of corn I plant, uh, where I market my crops. And so I said, OK, that's the end of the conversation. Yeah, patents have changed. They've changed everything. It revolves with a, with, with a relationship of trust with neighbors. That is gone. Uh, by myself, I probably only have two farmers that I talk to that are close to me. Are they really afraid, the farmers? Of course they're afraid. You can't defend yourself against these people. They've created a little industry that, that serves no other purpose than to wreck farmers' lives. Um, of course they're afraid. Does it mean that you're afraid, for instance, that the neighbor can snitch on you? Yes. Yes? Yeah. Yes. All you have to do is, is dial 1-800. Dial 1-800-Monsanto. Or no, I'm sorry, 1-800-Roundup. I remember encouraging farmers to uh, call this, this toll-free number and turn their neighbor in. And why does Monsanto do that? Well, the reason they do it is control. Seeds? Yeah. They want to control the seed. They want to own life. I mean, this is the building blocks of food we're talking about. They, they are in the process of owning food, all food. Between 1995 and 2005, Monsanto acquired over 50 seed companies throughout the world. These companies produce corn, cotton, wheat, and soybean, and also seeds for tomatoes, potatoes, and sorghum. Everywhere, people worry about Monsanto's monopoly, which in the long term threatens to wipe out all non-transgenic varieties. Monsanto doesn't agree and speaks only about the benefits of biotechnology, especially in developing countries like India. Our products provide significant economic benefits to both large and small growers. In many cases, farmers are able to grow higher quality and better yielding crops. India is the world's third largest cotton producer. In 1999, Monsanto acquired Mahiko, the country's leading seed company. Two years later, the Indian government authorized the sale of BT cotton under the brand name Balgard. It is genetically modified to produce an insecticide which repels ballworms, a cotton parasite. <laughs> Since 2001, Kiran Sakari and Abdul Gayam have been closely following the transgenic cotton grown by small farmers in the Warangal district. Every year, the two agronomists publish a report comparing bioengineered cotton with conventional cotton in terms of yields and production costs. In 2006, the harvest was ravaged by a disease that affects transgenic cotton. This is a Bolgard uh, field. Uh, and we can see some of the rhizoctonia affected plants. You see, if you remove the bark of a healthy plant, it, will, it won't be like this, like threads. See, it's a classic example of rhizoctonia infestation. The farmers, they have said they have never seen that. And uh, when we were doing our study from 2001, we have noted this disease on very few samples in the BT cotton only. And as the time passed, the spread was seen more and more in the BT fields as well as some non-BT fields also. But I personally feel that there may be some interaction, undesirable interaction, between the host plant where the gene was introduced and the gene which is carrying the BT. And that has introduced the weakness in the plant to not to resist this rhizoctonia. I have seen the, uh, the website of the uh, Mahiko Monsanto. BT cotton reduces 78 percent of the pesticide reduction, um, and pesticide consumption, and it gives to 30 percent better yields. But it's uh, it's an utter flop. After 70, 90 days, you, invariably you have to spray for uh, bollworms even on the BT cotton. How do you explain that so many farmers are buying 
BTC see the, presently the option is very very na is getting narrower and narrower to the farmer during the current season it even farmer wanted to go for non BT there was no non BT hybrid seed available in the market Today in India Monsanto controls nearly all of the cotton seed market forcing the locals to buy its seeds at prices four times higher than conventional varieties Small farmers must turn to money lenders who charge high interest rates. If the harvest is poor, it means bankruptcy, a vicious circle which is decimating Indian villages. Tragedies like the one we've just witnessed occur three times a day in the Vidharbha region, where BT cotton was introduced in 2005. Of course, cotton farmers committing suicide is not new in India, but the GM crops are causing it to skyrocket. However, in this battle that pits David against Goliath, few dare to publicly denounce this international scandal. This is Vidarbha's rice growing belt. So if you see the minimum suicides are there. But this is the cotton growing area. The result of the BT cotton is the first year 600 suicides from June 2005 to 2006. Second year, still today, within six months, 680 suicides. So, it's a disaster. It's a complete disaster, yes. All these technologies, either it is GM or biotechnology, they're actually making the farmers completely dependent on the market. Because not only that, you, you have to pay more for the seed procurement, but you, you have to fertilize it. And there, the, this very claim that no spraying is required, no pesticide is required, is also false. When Monsanto claims in advertising that GM crops are adapted for small farmers. What do you think it's? Our experience shows that it is completely false. It's completely false. It's a lie. On this day in December of 2006, a revolt was brewing in the largest cotton market in the state of Maharashtra. Three days later, riots broke out and dozens of small farmers, including Kishore Tiwari, were arrested. They don't want to go for the BT. <laughs> Seeds of Suicide is the title of a book by physicist Vandana Shiva. She won the alternative Nobel Prize and heads the Navdana organization, which aims to conserve traditional seeds. In the beginning, Vandana Shiva's battle was against the first green revolution, which brought industrial agriculture to India in the 1960s. Today, she denounces what she calls the second green revolution, that of GMOs protected by patents. 
The difference is that the first green revolution was public sector driven. It was driven